In this section, we're going to cover basic stock valuation using discounted cash flows. So what we're going to do is I'm first going to discuss the idea behind intrinsic value, and then we're going to talk about how stocks are actually valued using the discounted cash flows method. And then finally, we'll wrap up with a couple of examples using three distinct formulas for valuing companies using the, the discounted cash flows method. So let's talk about something first before we get to the intrinsic value definition. Uh, when a shareholder or an investor is trying to value a company, there's a couple of different ways that they can do it. They can use something called the market multiples method. Uh, the other way that they can use that is the way that we're going to talk about is they can actually calculate the expected future cash flows associated with that stock. So most stocks pay out, if they do pay out a particular cash flow, that's usually going to be in the form of a quarterly dividend. Now, most stocks in the United States do not actually pay dividends. So you have tech companies like, uh, let's say, Oh, well, really, any tech company is most likely not going to pay a dividend. The, the exceptions are usually companies like Apple or uh, very large tech companies that have very positive net income, very large cash flows. There are companies out there, however, uh, like Ford or GE or GM or, well, really most of the blue chip companies out there that will typically pay a quarterly dividend. And one of the ways that we can estimate the value of a company or its stock is by taking those dividends and discounting them back to the present. So what we're doing is we're estimating the expected future dividends from that stock, discounting it back to the present, and using that as our estimate for the firm's value or the what we'll dub the intrinsic value. The other type of cash flow that you can typically receive from owning a stock is simply by selling it. So you sell a stock for a capital gain, meaning you sell it for more than it's worth. Well, that cash flow has to be factored in when you're determining the intrinsic value of a stock. All right, now let's introduce one of our most important definitions with regard to stock valuation, intrinsic value. And intrinsic value is this idea of the underlying value of a given stock or a given asset. So if we were to use the discounted cash flows method, which I'll show you here in a few seconds, to discount all of a firm or a stock's expected future cash flows back to the present at some discount rate, what we're going to be left with is our intrinsic value, or sometimes we refer to it as the net present value or NPV the, the reason we do that is because the uh, Excel formula and the BA2 calculator calculate intrinsic value using net present value, or NPV. Uh, you probably noticed that on your calculator already. Now, our intrinsic value is that thing that we're trying to calculate when we're valuing a company. It's the underlying value of a stock or any asset based on its expected future cash flows. And we have a very hard definite rule for what we do once we calculate the intrinsic value. If our intrinsic value is larger than the market value of a given asset, we, we would strongly want to consider buying that asset. Why? Because that asset is undervalued. If we can buy it for less than it's actually intrinsically worth, it makes sense to buy that asset. On the flip side, if we calculate our intrinsic value and that intrinsic value is less than the price of the stock that's listed on, say, the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange, we would strongly want to sell our shares of that stock, the reason being that those shares are likely overvalued. Or if we didn't own shares, we could engage in something called a short trade, which means that we're essentially betting that the share price will depreciate to the intrinsic value over time. All right, now let's take a very quick look at how we actually value a stock using the time value of money formula and the discounted cash flows method. So in this example, suppose that you're thinking of purchasing the stock of Pennzoil. 
and you expect it to pay a $5 dividend in one year, and you believe that you can sell the stock at for $15 at that period of time, in time, so one year from now. And for all investments, you require a 10% return on your investment. What's the maximum you should be willing to pay? Well, in this case, all we have to do to calculate the intrinsic value of the stock is take all of our cash flows that we're expected to receive and discount them to the present at some discount rate. What discount rate? Well, 10%. I mean, if we're requiring a rate of return in order to invest in a particular stock, that 10% is what we're going to demand to earn those cash flows in the future. All right, so in this example, our dividend in year one, or at the end of year one, is $5. The price at the end of year one is expected to be $15. Our required rate of return is 10%. That's just the discount rate that we expect on the stock. And now, to calculate the cash flow that we are going to receive from this stock, all we do is just sum up the total value of all the cash that's going to be received by us at each point in time. So we only have one point in time when we're receiving cash in this case, and that is time period one, or one year from now. And we're receiving the dividend plus the value of the stock when we sell it. And our total cash flow in year one is just the $5 dividend plus the $15 for the stock uh, that we're expected to sell at that point in time. So our CF1, cash flow one, is $20. Now, the way we actually calculate our intrinsic value in this case is simply by using the time value of money buttons on our BA2 calculator and the, the time value of money formula. So I, since we've already talked about the time value of money formula, I didn't bother putting it on this slide, but you can get a sense of exactly what we're doing here. Uh, so all I've done is I've taken the time value of money formula and I've moved the one plus R to the power of T over to the other side. So we're essentially discounting our future value. In this case, it's going to be five plus $15 or $20 by one plus our R in this case, which is 10% to the power of one. So the reason we're discounting over uh, with an exponent of one or a time of one is because we're discounting for one year. And this means in this case, our $20 divided by 1.1 is $18.18 .18 a share. This is our intrinsic value. It, this formula, this calculation tells us that if this stock is trading for $18.18 .18 a share or less, then we might seriously want to consider purchasing shares of this stock. Remember, intrinsic value needs to be higher than the market share price of this stock. Now, if the market share price of this stock is greater than $18.18, .18, then we would say this stock is overvalued based on the discounted cash flows that we calculated. All right, that was a pretty simple example. Let's try another example. So suppose that you're thinking of purchasing a stock, the stock of ExxonMobil and selling it three years hence. Apparently I went British when I was writing this example. Uh, you expect it to pay a $5 dividend at the end of the first year and a $6 dividend at the end of years two and three. And finally, you believe you can sell the stock for $15 at that time, at time period three. And again, you require a 10% return on investments of this risk. Uh, what's the maximum you should be willing to pay for the stock? Well, just like in the previous example, all we have to do to value this stock is estimate our future cash flows in each period and then discount them back to the present at our discount rate. In this case, 10%. We demand a 10% rate of return on this investment, and so that's going to be our discount rate. So in this case, our price at the end of year three, the price that we're going to sell the stock for is $15. Our R, or discount rate, is given as 10%. Our CF1, or the dividend that we receive in year one, or at the end of year one, is $5. Our cash flow or dividend at the end of year two is $6, that was given. Finally, our cash flow in year three is our dividend in year three, which was $6, plus the price of the stock that we're selling in year three. So grand total, our cash flow in year three is $21. This is the total amount of all the cash 
that we receive at the end of year three that we're going to dis discount back to the present. Now, the way we actually calculate the intrinsic value of this stock is simply by expanding the time value of money formula. So what we have here is our price right now, or rather we could call this our intrinsic value, is equal to the sum of all of our cash flows discounted to the present at one plus our R to the power of T, which in this case is the number of years that we're discounting for. So our cash flow in year one is $5, and we're discounting it for one year at a rate of 10%. So we have five divided by 1.1 to the power of one. Our cash flow in year two is $6, and so we're discounting that by one plus R squared. So in this case, that's 1.1 to the second. And finally, our cash flow in year three is the sum of our dividend plus the sale of the stock. So we're selling it for $15. So grand total, our cash flow in year three is $21 discounted back to the present at 1.1 to the third. Grand total, the intrinsic value of this stock is $25.28. And we still have that same investing rule. If this stock is trading for less than $25.28, that tells us that this stock is slightly undervalued relative to our expectations or what our, our expected discounted cash flows are worth. If the stock is trading for, let's say, $30 or $40, that stock is overvalued based on our expectations of future cash flows and our discount rate. So we would want to sell our shares if it was trading for more than what we have here, $25.28. All right, now let's talk about how we actually calculate the intrinsic value using the BA2 calculator. So we're going to introduce a couple of new buttons on the BA2, and I have here on the screen the exact buttons that you're going to enter in order to get the net present value or intrinsic value that I just calculated in this example. So we're using the same example, and we're going to use the CF and NPV buttons on our BA2 calculator. So I'm going to walk over to our BA2, and turn it on. And what you'll notice right above the time value of money buttons, you'll see the CF button and the BA2, or sorry, the NPV button. And these are the buttons that we use to estimate cash flows and then calculate the, the intrinsic value of an asset based on those future cash flows. So in this previous example, we had a $5 cash flow in year one, a $6 cash flow in year uh, two, and then a $21 cash flow in year three. To calculate the intrinsic value using the BA2, you're first going to click on the CF button. And what you see when it comes up is CF0. And CF0 tells us that our cash flow in year zero is, well, X. We're going to enter something in or leave it as a zero. In this case, we're just going to leave it as zero for now. And then we're going to hit the down arrow. So if I hit the down arrow, you see C01. This tells us our, this is our cash flow in period one. So for here, we had a cash flow of $5. Now to enter in our cash flow of $5 in this case, we're going to hit five and then go up to enter. And when you hit enter, you should see this equal sign up here and you'll see a triangle appear up here at the top right. So that lets you know that you've locked in that $5 cash flow. Next, let's hit the down arrow. And when we do that, you'll see F01. This tells us the frequency of that $5 cash flow, that, that $5 cash flow that we entered in in C01. So if we wanted to tell the calculator that this $5 cash flow was being received for, let's say, five or 10 periods, we'd enter in five, a five or a 10 here. But we're only receiving this $5 cash flow for one year, so I'm going to leave it as a one and hit the down arrow. Next, our cash flow in year two, or C02, is six. So I'm going to hit six, enter, and then go down. And we're receiving that $6 cash flow for one year. So we're good here. F02 should be equal to one. And I'll hit the down arrow again. And finally, our CF3, our cash flow in year three, is $21. So I'm going to hit 21, enter. And we've locked that in. 
And just to be sure, I'm going to hit the down arrow and we do have F03 equal to one. So now we're good. Next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over to the NPV button. And there, when you hit it, you'll see this I equals. And I equals is the BA2 calculator's signal for us to enter in our discount rate. It's the rate at which we're discounting all of those cash flows that we just entered. So in this case, our discount rate was given as 10%. So I'm going to enter in 10. Uh, notice here that the I that you're entering, the discount rate that you're entering, is in percentage terms. So a 10% interest rate or a 10% discount rate is entered in as just 10. And to lock it in, I'm going to press the Enter button. All right, so now we've locked it in. You can see the equal sign. You can see the triangle up here. Now, if I scroll down, you'll see NPV. We're at the final stage now. So all we need to do to calculate the NPV of the stream of cash flows that I entered at the discount rate that I entered is go up to the CPT or compute key and just press it. And what we find is that the NPV of this stream of cash flows discounted to the present is $25.28, which is exactly what we found in this example when we did it by hand. So that's that. That's how we use the time value of money buttons. All right, now the example I just gave you was fairly straightforward and a little simplistic. The issue that we often have with stock valuation is that we don't just have three years or three periods. I mean, maybe if you have a case like Sears or GE or a company that's really struggling, uh, but usually we expect stocks to uh, pay out cash flows or dividends often to perpetuity, often to forever. I mean, uh, in the case of a lot of companies out there, I guess GE would be the, the classic example where it's been listed on, or it was listed on the uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average since the inception of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. But uh, nowadays it's, it's not doing so hot. Uh, the, the issue that we have is that stocks will often have decades worth or be expected to have hundreds of years worth of dividends or cash flows that we have to discount back to the present. I mean, you think of Apple, it's been around for about 40 years and it's been paying dividends for a while now. So if we're an investor and we want to value Apple, we have to discount all of its expected future cash flows all the way, say 50 years in the future, 100 years in the future, back to the present. And the issue with that is that it gets pretty tedious if we have to enter in all of those cash flows on the BA2 or just use the time value of money and do the calculation by hand. So what I'm about to show you are three ways that we usually use to simplify the process. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'll introduce those three ways right now. Now the first way that we simplify the valuation of stocks that have, well, perpetual dividends or uh, dividends going out into perpetuity forever uh, is we have a constant dividend or a zero growth in the dividend case. This formula or this, this case indicates that our dividend stays the same from now until 100 years from now and 1,000 years from now and forever. In this special case, we assume that the dividend is constant. It doesn't change and it will never change. Uh, there are a couple of financial products where this would be the case. Uh, the, the classic example would be a perpetuity, which is a special type of annuity product issued by insurance companies. Uh, so it pays out a certain regular amount every quarter, every month, every year, depending on the product. Uh, and we value it based on that, that payment. The other case that we often give is preferred stock. And I know I talked about that in an earlier lecture. So uh, if you want to take a look at exactly what preferred stock is, please see our previous example. But essentially, it's just a, a hybrid between a bond and a stock that pays out a regular, usually quarterly dividend. And that dividend stays the same forever unless the firm just doesn't have enough cash flow to pay that dividend. Uh, so it might uh, discontinue that dividend for a quarter or two. But once it comes back, it'll be at the same level that it was prior to being uh, uh, suspended. Now, the next type of, well, the next special case that we have is the constant 
dividend growth example. So we're going to introduce a formula that will allow us to value a company that has slightly increasing dividends, or rather in dividends that increase by a certain percentage every quarter or every year. Uh, you can see why this would be a valuable formula. Most companies tend to like to increase their dividends slightly over time. So if you look at, say, companies like Ford or uh, GE for a long time or IBM or Microsoft, a lot of those companies, they typically like to slowly increase their dividend uh, through time. Uh, the reason being that a lot of those companies are what we consider blue chip companies. They have a lot of cash flow and they might not have the ideal, they might not have a, a lot of good places to invest that cash flow that they've earned. And so a lot of times they just decide to return it to shareholders in the form of a dividend. So we'll value a couple of uh, companies that look like that in a few seconds. The last example that we have is a case where we have what's called supernormal growth, or I guess I could say abnormal or variable growth. Uh, in this case, we have essentially two periods. We have what we sometimes dub the forecasting period, where we have really volatile growth or volatile dividends for a couple of years or a couple of periods. And then after that, we have what's called the forecasting period. And in the forecasting, or, the, the second period is called the terminal value period. And the terminal value period is that period right after the forecasting period where our dividends grow at a very constant uh, rate off into perpetuity. So what we're going to do with the supernormal growth uh, valuations is we're going to break those, those stocks up into that those valuations into two parts and we're gonna value the forecasting period and then we'll value the terminal value period and discount that terminal value valuation back to the present. And that's how we get around the, the volatility of those cash flows. But for now, let's start with our most basic case, the case where we have zero dividend growth. And in this case, the way we value these companies is we take the dividend or the cash flow, depending on what uh, measure you wanna use, and we divide it by our discount rate. So if we have a required rate of return or an expected return on that stock, all we're going to do to price that stock is divide the dividend, let's say the quarterly dividend or the annual dividend that we receive from the stock, by that expected return. And this formula, the perpetuity formula, which you see right now, this will give us the intrinsic value of that asset. So. Let's take a look at an example. Suppose our stock is expected to pay a $1 quarterly dividend forever, and the required return on the stock is 10%, compounded quarterly. What is the price? Well, all we have to do to value this, this example is just use the perpetuity formula. So in this case, we have a quarterly dividend of $1, and we have a return on the stock of 10%, compounded quarterly. So what we can do is we can divide that 10% return by four, and that'll give us a 2.5% return every quarter. So we're essentially dividing one by our quarterly return of 2.5%, and we find that the intrinsic value of this stock uh, is going to be $40. So that's, that's more or less how valuation with a constant dividend works. It's, it's really just as simple as that. Next, we have the constant growth uh, valuation method. And when we value a stock that has constant, constantly growing dividends or its dividends are growing at a constant rate, uh, we usually, what we're going to do is we're going to assume that the dividend a year from now and the dividend two years from now are going to be calculated as our dividend today or D0 multiplied by one plus G, which is our growth rate to the power of, well, T, the number of time periods over which we're, our, our dividend is appreciating. So as you can see from this slide, let's take D2. Our dividend at the end of year two is equal to our dividend today, or D0, times the quantity of one plus G, which is our dividend growth rate in percentage terms, to the second power. We're essentially assuming that our, we're allowing our dividend today to grow at one plus G for two years. And that's, that's pretty much uh, how we calculate our future dividends using the constant growth uh, assumption. Now, with the constant growth model, 
we do have a, a formula that allows us to value all of those future dividends or future expected dividends that grow at a constant rate. And uh, this formula will allow us to discount all of those dividends back to the present. And that formula is the second one I have up there. It's that P sub zero equal to D zero times one plus G divided by R minus G. Now, this formula is, it has a couple of different names depending on who you ask. Some people will call it the dividend discount model. Others will call it the, uh, the dividend growth model. I think your book also calls it the dividend growth model. I, that's why I kind of stuck with this name. Other people will actually call it the Gordon growth model. And the reason for that, I think, is the guy that came up with this uh, for stock valuation, I think his last name was Gordon. Uh, regardless of what people refer to it as, it's just really the, the constant dividend growth discount model. I mean, there's, there's a, a bunch of names for it, but everyone recognizes this formula. Now, if we know our dividend or our expected dividend a year from now, all we have to do to value a stock with that information is divide that dividend by our R, or discount rate, minus the G, or dividend growth rate. And we'll get, like I said, we're going to use this in practice here in a second. Now, a couple of final points on this model. First, we're assuming that our growth rate is constant forever. Our G is just our G forever. So if we have a G of 2%, we're assuming that our dividend is growing for 2% every single year or every single period off into perpetuity. A thousand years from now, it's still growing at 2%. Usually that's not realistic in the real world. I mean, if there's a financial crisis, the, the company might cut its dividend or it might uh, suspend its dividend altogether. Uh, that's reality. Uh, next, our stock price is expected to grow at R or that discount rate forever. So if we have an expected return on the stock of 10%, we're assuming that that stock in this model is growing at 10%. That stock off is offering us a return of 10% every single year. And finally, and probably most crucially, our R, our discount rate, our expected return on this stock always has to be larger than our G, our dividend growth rate. And you might have already seen why, just looking at the formula, but just to show you, so down here in our denominator, if we have a case where our, our dividend growth rate is larger than our expected return, then this denominator is going to be negative. Uh, the reason for this is if we have, let's say, a 5% expected return and a 10% dividend growth rate, that negative 5% means that our intrinsic value is going to be negative. And I'm not an accountant, so I, uh, I normally say that uh, we cannot have a negative value of a stock. Uh, the worst we can have is a stock that is worthless in the real world. So uh, I, uh, in this case, I mean, we, we, if we ever have a case where our expected return is less than our dividend growth percentage, we usually just scrap this model. We don't use this model because it, it wouldn't make sense. But that's something that uh, we always deal with. All right, now let's use that model to value a stock. So suppose Edradour Distillery just paid a, an annual dividend of $2. It's expected to increase its dividend by 3% per year, and the market requires a 14% return on assets of this risk. How much should this stock be selling for? All right, a couple of points. First, you might have noticed that I like Scotch whiskey. Uh, that's actually, uh, that Edredor Distillery is the smallest distillery in all of Scotland. Uh, three full-time employees. I was very pleased to find that out uh, when I went over there uh, recently. Now, uh, side note, I guess that's a side note, but uh, uh, first, when you're looking at a problem like this, uh, I want to point out a couple of things. So. I realize most of the people watching this video are not going to be financial professionals, but if you are, let's say you're considering a career in actuarial science and you're going to be taking the actuarial exams or let's say the CFA exams or some other professional exams, one thing I want to point out to you is that a lot of those exams have word problems and those word problems will be very similar to what you see right here. Uh, when you see the phrase just paid, 
like I have here, that's usually a, an absolute indicator that our D0 is going to be $2. Uh, the dividend that was just paid is exactly what we're talking about when we say D0, the dividend today. Uh, so in this case, our D0 is $2. Uh, our G here is going to be 3%. Just because it's, I mean, our, expect, our dividend is expected to grow by 3% per year. Our market rate of return is 14%. We'll talk about why the market expects a return on a 14% in a later lecture, but for now we could just set that as 14%. And what we're going to do is we're going to plug this information into the dividend growth model or that Gordon growth model that I just showed you. And we're going to pump out an answer. So I will flip over to a piece of paper and let's get going. So we have D0 equal to 2, G is equal to 0 0.03, and R is equal to 0.14. All right, now our price is equal to D0 times 1 plus G divided by R minus G. That's our dividend growth model. All we have to do to value this stock is just plug in our information. So our D here, our D0 is 2 times 1 plus 0 0.03 divided by 0 0.114 minus 0 0.03. And so I'm going to work this on the calculator. And we have 2 times 1.03 divided by this denominator is going to be 0.11. And so we have a price or intrinsic value of $18 and 70, we'll round up to 73 cents. So that's that. If we wanted to value this company, we would say that this company's stock is likely worth about $18 and 73 cents. All right. Now let's take a look at another more complicated example. So in the last example, we had constantly growing dividends at a 3% rate. We don't always have that in the real world. Sometimes we have to estimate uh, our dividends, and our estimated dividends are going to be a little more variable than what you just saw in that last example that I made up. Uh, so let's take a look at this example. Suppose a firm is expected to increase dividends by 15% in one year and by 10% in two years. After that, dividends will increase at a rate of 5% per year indefinitely, and if today's dividend was $1 and the required return is 20%, what is the price of the stock? All right, so the issue we have here is that we don't have a constantly growing dividend. It grows by 15% the first year, 10% uh, the next year, and then 5% thereafter. So this is really one of those perfect super normal cases where we have really a case where we can break our valuation up into a forecasting period and then a terminal value period and value each of those periods separately. So that's exactly what we're going to do. And to do that, we're going to use both of those formulas that you've already seen up on the screen. We're going to use the time value of money formula where we just calculate all of our dividends. And we're also going to use the dividend growth model formula to value the terminal value. I'll show you how we do that in a second. How about right now? All right, so here's how we're going to value this, this stock that has variable growth in its dividends. We have really two periods here. We have our forecasting period where our dividend grows by 15% in the first year and 10% in the next year. And then starting with the third dividend and ending with our D infinity, uh, we're, our dividend is growing by 5% per year. So our terminal value period is everything after the second dividend. Now, what we're going to do with the forecasting period is we're just going to value those dividends. We're just going to use the time value of money formula and discount those dividends back to the present at one plus R to the first and then uh, one plus R squared for that second dividend. The terminal value period, the way we're going to value it is we're going to treat that entire terminal value period as if it's, it's like the, uh, well, we have a constant dividend. So what we can do here is use the dividend growth model and value all of those future dividends back to year two. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the dividend growth model to value those terminal value dividends 
and get an intrinsic value of all those dividends as of year two. And then we're going to discount that intrinsic value as of year two back to the present. Uh, so what you can see here is exactly what I've been talking about. So we're going to use that dividend growth model. And instead of putting in uh, D0 times the quantity of one, mi one plus G, we're putting in D2 times the quantity of one plus G divided by R minus G. And so that formula is going to give us the intrinsic value of all those terminal value dividends uh, as if it was year two. And then we're going to just discount that terminal value period at a rate of the quantity of one plus R squared. So we're just taking that, that discounted uh, intrinsic value and we're discounting it further. And what we're going to be left with is what you see down here, where we have really just the, the forecasting period dividends that we're discounting, and then the intrinsic price of the terminal value period as of year two that we're discounting back to the present. All right, so what is this going to look like? Well, I thought it might be more helpful to just write it up or draw it up on the screen here. So in the first year, well, in D0, we have a dividend of $1. Our dividend, our dividend in, at the end of year one is 1.15 because our dividend growth rate is 15%. Our dividend in year two is 1.265 because it's 1.265 is just 1.15 times one plus 10%. Finally, our dividend in year three is just going to be our dividend in year two times one plus 0 0.05 because our growth rate in our dividend in year three is 5%. All right, so to value our forecasting period, basically our dividends in years one and two, what we're going to do is just take 1.15 and divide it by one plus 0.15 to the first, and that gives us our, our discounted value of our cash flow in year one of 0.9583. Next, we're going to take our dividend in year two and discount it by the quantity of one plus G to the second power, or rather, uh, well, I'm sorry, uh, one plus R to the second power. Uh, so our R here is 20%, so we're essentially dividing this 1.265 by 1.2 to the second, and that's how we get this 0.8785. And then finally, to value our terminal value cash flows or dividends, what we're going to do is we can either use the first formula of the dividend growth model or the second formula. And we can use either this formula or this formula. So if we use this formula, our what we're going to enter here is the dividend in year two. If we use this formula, what we're going to enter in is the dividend in year three. It, you'll get the same result regardless, but I'm going to go ahead and since I've already worked it and put it up here, I'm going to value these cash flows going forward using the third period dividend. So what we have here is our third period dividend divided by R minus G, so 0.2 minus 0 0.05. And that means that our price uh, of all of those future, or our intrinsic value of all of those future dividends starting after year two is $8.85. Now, the last step here is to discount this 8.85 back to the present at our discount rate, which is 20%. So all I'm doing is just taking 8.85 divided by one plus R to the second. So 1.2 to the second. And that's how we get 6.14858. Now, the, I guess the final step, the final, final step is to sum up all of our discounted cash flows. And that's exactly what I've done here. I just took 0.9583 plus 0.8785 plus 6.1458. And that gives us our intrinsic value of this stock of 7.9826. These examples uh, with super normal, these are a lot more complicated, obviously, but they're a lot, they're more based in reality. I mean, if we're valuing a company, this would be more along the lines of what we would wanna do if we're valuing a company or a stock. I mean, 
Uh, that, I mean, dividends don't always grow at the same constant rate starting today. They don't al always have the, the same uh, no growth rate like we saw with the first case. I mean, this is, this is a lot more applicable to the real world. All right. Now that we've gone through the three formulas or models that we often use to value stocks, uh, it's time we actually talk about how we can use one of these models to predict returns on a stock. And the way that we can do that is by rearranging our dividend growth model. Uh, so if you remember, our dividend growth model was this thing up here. Our price is equal to today's dividend times the quantity of 1 plus our dividend growth rate to, uh, divided by R minus G, our discount rate minus R growth rate. If we want to rearrange this model, we can actually solve for R. And if we know our current dividend or our dividend or expected dividend next year, we can actually estimate our expected return on a stock using this rearranged dividend growth model. So what we do is we take this R minus G over to the left-hand side uh, and then uh, solve for R. And what we're left with is either this formula or this one, which looks a little nicer, just our, di our expected dividend next year divided by the current price of the stock plus our dividend growth rate is equal to our expected return on the stock. So let's take a look at an example where we actually predict the, the return on this stock. So in this example, Ford's shareholders just received a 50 cent dividend, uh, and Ford's dividend grows at a 4% rate, and the share price is currently $12. What is the required return on this stock? All right. So to solve this, all I'm going to do is I'm going to use the formula that we just had. Uh, so, well, first I'm going to put in our inputs that, we're, that we have. So our D0 in this case is going to be 0.5. That's 50 cent uh, dividend in today. Uh, next, we have a dividend growth rate G of 0 0.04. And then finally, we have a P0 of 12. Now, going back to the formula that we just had, uh, since we already have our D0, I'm not going to bother calculating our D1. We'll just uh, say that R is equal to D0 times 1 plus G divided by R minus G. And all we have to do to calculate our expected or required return is just plug in stuff. So 0 0.5 times 1 plus 0 0.04 divided by uh, uh, 12 plus 0 0.04. And so when we work this out, 0.5 times 1.04 divided by 12 plus 0 0.04 gives us an 8.33% return on this stock. So that's that. Now, I do want to point out one final point here with this example. Notice here that I called this return the required return. The reason we sometimes refer to this return with regard to stocks as the required return is because this is the return that we are requiring as shareholders in order for that dividend to be, in order for that price to be $12.00 and justify that, that 50 cent dividend and that 4% that dividend growth rate. In other words, this is the return that we demand for this stock with this level of risk and these expected future cash flows. Uh, we use this term required return almost synonymously with expected return. It's, it's just kind of uh, something that we, we use flippantly in, in, uh, in finance. So that's more or less uh, it. So with that, I will summarize uh, what we just covered. So the discounted cash flows method, which we just used, is one of our best methods for valuing stocks in the United States. Uh, I say in the United States because in the United States, our stocks have a lot more information about them, and it's a lot easier to value future expect expected cash flows. And uh, inflation is not as big of a concern in say, the U.S. as it is in Brazil, uh, so, or name another country that has high inflation. 
Uh, so the discounted cash flows method is very good at valuing companies where we can estimate future, dis estimate future cash flows and where we have a lot of information to say that those cash flow estimates are very accurate. Uh, next, we discuss the three basic formulas or methods for valuing uh, stock using discounted cash flows. So we talked about the no growth model, the, uh, the constant growth model, and then the super, north, the super normal growth model. And uh, each of those is used in very particular cases, although I'd say that in the real world, we probably, if we're doing a full valuation of a company, we probably use the super normal growth model a little more frequently than the other two. Uh, the reason being it's, it's more applicable to the real world. And then finally, uh, I did show you that the dividend growth model can be rearranged to solve for the expected or required return. And we do use that occasionally, but in a future lecture, I am gonna show you a better method for predicting returns. So with that, I'm going to wrap up and I'll see you on the next video.